my name is Blaine Hansen, and today we are talking about democracy. And I'm specifically going to try to convince you that democracy doesn't have to suck. Um, that we can use better systems, better logical methods to do our voting that can make democracy actually work. Um, and specifically, I'm going to be talking about persistent democracy. Um, kind of a, a cluster of a bunch of different things that I've been kind of working on lately that I think would really solve this problem. Maybe even provably solve this problem. I'll get to that at the end. Okay, let's first ask this question. Why are our democracies broken? What exactly is the problem? If I ask most people, I think the answer I'd get is some version of this. You know, people suck too much. People can't do democracy. They're too irrational. They're ignorant. You know, all these, all these problems that people have. And that these weaknesses in human beings make it just impossible for human beings to do this democracy thing well. So it's always going to be kind of a mess. I'm going to try to convince you that's not true, although it is true that people do suck sometimes. I'm not going to try to convince you people are perfect, that we're all angels. But what I'm really going to try to convince you is that the real problem is that our voting methods suck. The, the basically the logical systems, the way our voting is structured, makes it so that it, even, even perfect people, even angels, would have terrible, messy democracies that wouldn't work using the voting systems we use. Um, specifically that our voting methods actually make us worse. Right? They take the, the, the worst parts of, of our nature and they exacerbate them and they give them all the control. And that's not what voting methods and democracy is supposed to do. The whole point of democracy is that it's supposed to kind of help us smooth out all of the, the rough edges of a large group of people. And you know, crazy people over here balance out crazy people over here, and everyone gets time to think, and we come to decisions that everyone's okay with. That's the whole point of democracy, and I'm going to try to prove to you that that's true. And I guess the yeah the the thesis statement I would say of this talk is that irrational systems make irrational choices, rational necessities. Right? People have to do stupid, bad, harmful things because of the systems we have. They have no other choice than to do that. Otherwise, they have no voice and no control. Um, and I guess here's like a, the broad kind of structure of this talk. You know, we're talking about just kind of first, the whole first section will be about, you know, why our systems are bad and how those produce bad outcomes, specifically some of these issues. Then we'll go through this persistent democracy thing that I've been working on, and I'm going to try to convince you that that would solve a lot of these problems. Um, it's kind of a a combination of a bunch of different things. And then, you know, if, if I've convinced you at that point that, oh, this persistent democracy stuff is great, we should do it, then how do we actually get there? How do we achieve that in real life? How do we do so in a way that's not super risky or going to cause other problems? And then at the end, I'm going to make the bigger philosophical point that what I'm calling true democracy, I'll define that later on, true democracy is a moral imperative that we kind of have no choice ethically than to solve this problem, to figure out how to make democracy actually work. If we don't, we will always have an uneth unethical society, period. OK, so I'm going to breeze over this really quick. This is one of these points about you know, why systemically things are broken. But it's something that, it's something that is definitely a problem, but is kind of going to be solved in later on things. I want to get to this later. But certainly one of the big problems with our democracies is that we have a, a toxic media e um, ecosystem um, that is specifically created by the inherent structure of for-profit media. You know, for-profit media has, has no incentive, has no motive other than to give people whatever they, will, whatever they will pay for. But even worse, not even, you know, paying for something is one thing. Whereas advertising is the usual model for most media, and advertising is just, can I get eyeballs? You know, I don't have to, I don't have to convince someone to buy something that's good. I just get them to watch. Um, so anyway, the, the toxic media ecosystem and for-profit media have exacerbated a lot of the things I'm going to talk about. And they've made politics into a big, stupid horse race that it shouldn't be. But this is solved, this is solved by something I'm going to talk about later. I think the solution is simple but it's not easy. It's this idea of cooperatives, so the idea of media companies that are owned by their audience, but we'll get to that later. So, okay, first section, bad systems, 
create bad outcomes. Um, and specifically, I think I'm going to take aim first at this idea of plurality voting and try to redefine what you think of as even what democracy even is. A lot of people, when they hear the word democracy, they tend to think like, they tend to think that this idea of plurality voting. And what plurality voting is, is when you have an election and there's a bunch of candidates you can choose from and you get to choose one of them. That's what most people think of as democracy. That's not what democracy is. <laughs> um, democracy is, at least the way I'm defining it, I think a way that makes much more sense, is not that everyone gets one exact vote all the time. That's a really narrow view of what democracy is. Democracy is just everyone has the same amount of input, the same amount, right? Um, every person can, can the, the weight of their preferences, the weight of their input, is considered the same as everyone else's. But the shape of that output can vary wildly, right? It doesn't have to be one person, one simple vote. We can do all kinds of other things that are still democratic and work better. So let's talk about why this plurality, vo plurality voting thing is so horribly terrible, <laughs> why it has created almost a lot of the problems we see. The biggest, the biggest and most obvious thing is that it allows this really, this incredibly stupid possible outcome to happen, which is called the spoiler effect, which is where, you know, if, if a plurality voting election has only two candidates, then it makes sense and it's perfectly reasonable, where basically just the, whichever side gets more wins. But that's this overly simple idea of one person, one vote. <laughs> it creates a situation where you, if you just have two candidates that are kind of you know, splitting the vote, where they are kind of um, clones of each other, right? Or they're just broadly similar, and they kind of get the same people to split up into two groups, suddenly a majority will not win, right? And the thing is, this doesn't make any sense. Um, this is just like an irrationality. And what it means is that third parties always have this kind of way of, of, of attacking, or there's this way of, of attacking the election and making it do something that most people wouldn't want it to do. Um, this creates just a horrifying kind of cyclical problem. Um, you know, think about it. If, if a system's like this, where the only elections that make any sense, that are at all predictable, at all reasonable, make anyone happy, are elections where there's only two candidates, what that means is that the entire system around this election, these elections, has to contort itself into whatever shape is necessary to make sure that almost all the time there's only two candidates, only, only at least only two real candidates. So the whole structure around this, right, because elections matter, elections are extremely important, they determine who holds the levers of power and what our, our society is going to, to do. Suddenly, you know, the party, political parties have incentives to try to change the structure of the electoral process such that you know only two parties can ever really truly exist because otherwise otherwise those two parties would not be able to predict elections and would probably slowly die after all these weird irrational outcomes um, the media right all of the stuff around the political parties such as these for-profit media companies or even other media companies they have to find an audience they have to appeal to someone and since you know the political parties are always in this this um, structurally enforced two-party system they kind of have to cater to that way of thinking and that leaks into the way that voters think right if i know that i can't actually have a meaningful voice if i don't vote for one of the two major parties then there's a lot of reason for me to figure out how to lie to myself and and find a way to get on a bandwagon or at the very least join in and even if i'm holding my nose so the point is, this is something that, that reinforces this cycle over and over again, where over time, everything gets more polarized, everything gets more calcified, everything gets more toxic, everything gets more unreasonable. Because there's, it's impossible, it's structurally impossible to come into an election like this and hold kind of a, a, third, a third or nuanced or, or whatever view. Because the structure of the voting method itself doesn't allow the electorate to make that kind of decision. It's just not possible. So this is what we've seen, I think, in our country over the last, you know, 150 years or whatever, um, as at least as, you know, the voting methods have gone away from simple, like, party methods, 
is that this bad voting method structurally enforces, it structurally creates everything around it in, in, in its shape. It enforces that everything else becomes similarly toxic and irrational. So this problem is somewhat easy to solve, um, at least in the short term. This isn't a, this isn't a perfect solution. But there's uh, other voting methods. I think the, the whole, all the score voting methods are better. Approval voting is one that's very realistic. We could do it tomorrow, right? In our country, we could just switch to this tomorrow, and a lot of things would get a lot better immediately. Um, and approval voting, you just get to vote for all, all the people you, you like, all the ones that you approve of. You get to say yes. This has a bunch of really good consequences. This isn't a vote of, uh, talk about approval voting. But yeah, we should do this tomorrow, but then move to more complicated things. In general, you know, again, like I said, approval voting fits into kind of a whole category of voting systems called score voting methods. And, you know, this could be 1 to 100 or 0 to 1,000 or whatever. It doesn't really matter. The simplest version is 0 to 1, which is really what approval voting is. Um, yeah, so these are great. And just, as, just, just to drive by this on my way, this isn't a, a, a talk about this, but a lot of people say that ranked choice voting is something we should do. I actually think that is that is definitively not true. Ranked choice would actually probably be worse in, in lots of ways. Um, it doesn't actually solve the spoiler effect we were talking about. It has extra weird stuff that happens, but there's, there's a bunch of pathologies that you probably don't even realize are possible in ranked choice that are. Um, but most, most importantly, ranked choice doesn't measure the thing that we care about. Um, in a scores voting system, we're basically measuring, oh, for this for each voter, how much does that candidate make that voter happy? Right? How much do they like them? And then we add up all the scores, and the person who makes the most happiness wins. That's the thing we care about. That's what we're trying to achieve in an election, is, is choose the candidate that creates the most voter satisfaction. And ranked choice structures it as like some sort of weird tournament. It, it's, it's arbitrarily this competitive two against two thing that the algorithm is all crazy. Again, this isn't a talk about this. I'm, I'm driving by this. Go look into it. <laughs> Um, there's, there's links that I'll post to in the description that give this more color. But even, even this idea of score voting systems or approval voting, it's not good enough because it solves that most, that really big important problem, the spoiler effect, and other, it solves other problems at the same time. But it kind of leaves one of these really big problems wide open which is um, something I'm going to call spam voting in the next couple slides, which is where you know, a casual majority who prefer, prefers one option like a little bit, you know, but doesn't really care that much, they outnumber a small minority of people who intensely prefer one option over the other um, and maybe even would be very upset with, with a different option. So, you know, like with these squares, of the, the, big, the big number of people outweighs the small number of people. But if we were kind of counting up, you know, I don't know, preference points, happiness points, whatever you want to call them, then the, the outcome would be different. Um, you know, the, the, the 1,000 people care more. The tricky part is, you know, we need a voting system that can actually measure this and do a good job of it. Um, but just generally, what this problem allows, this idea of, I guess, you know, casual majorities, or what's called the tyranny of the majority, is this thing called spam voting. So spam voting is essentially where someone votes on a topic, right? They vote in an election, but they don't actually care that much. Maybe they haven't really even thought about it. It's not important to them. That's, it's not something that if they had to choose between things to vote on, they'd choose this. Um, so the thing is, in a system where it costs you nothing, where you can just vote for everything all the time, and all of your votes are, are weighed the same amount, it's rational to, to vote in all of them. Because you might care a, a little tiny bit, you know? And maybe you're only voting because, oh, you know, I'm just trying to wage war for my party that in our two-party system, you know, if, if my party gets stronger, I get stronger, even if that's not a good dichotomy. So it's, it's rational to do this. It's rational to spam vote in a system that allows spam voting. So it's not really people's fault they're not being irrational for doing that. They're just doing what the system is, it requires of them. This is a huge problem, right? Because it means we don't actually know what people care about. And you know we can, we can chalk this spam voting problem up to many of the other deeper n n problems in our society. 
So it's another thing that creates polarization, right? If you have a district, for, I mean, and to take our example of our extremely divided two-party country, you know, who, for example, has won a congressional district is more a measurement of which, which party has more members in that, in that place, rather than how many of them actually care and think that candidate is a good option. It's more if just, you know, the two-party war being fought with numbers. Um, you know, people do things like straight ticket voting. And you can say maybe that straight ticket voting is a good thing, but it doesn't seem like it's actually someone thinking deeply about what they want society to look like. It's just cheap for them to do. So they say, oh, all, all of these. Um, this, of course, creates un unaccountable officials because someone gets voted in just because their district is more one way than the other. And there's never going to be an option that's going to outweigh them because the local party leadership is always going to nominate them. Even things like NIMBYism, NIMBY standing for not in my backyard, the kind of weird zoning problems that make it hard for communities to build useful things that they actually genuinely want. You know, it's cheap for someone to say, oh, no, I would be slightly inconvenienced by that park being there or that road being there. And so I'll, I'll create a fuss about it, even though if you really pushed me, I wouldn't care that much. And just generally, yeah, uh, spam voting, you know, noise, gridlock, it's, it's responsible, I think, for most of that. This is really my pitch here. This idea, and it makes sense why, is, is responsible for so much of the, the gridlock and the, the, the kind of stigmatization or the problems in our, in our polity. Because again, people aren't voting based on what they care about. They're vote voting based on some arbitrary war. So this problem is actually pretty easily solved. Implementing these systems is hard, but the solution is pretty simple, which is that every voter has some you know, pool of resources. Um, this is resource voting methods, where you have some number of votes, so to speak, and you can put more of them on things you care more about, and you can not put any on things you don't care about. This is extremely powerful and simple, because what it means is that you have a finite supply of, of votes, a finite supply of, you know, amount of, amount of pain you can create for other people in society, amount of weight you can, you can force what you want, which means you have to actually strategically choose. What do I care about? Um, so, for example, this, there's a particular version of this called quadratic voting we'll talk about in two seconds. Um, that's from a book called Radical Markets, but ra markets in the kind of economic sense, not the political sense. But quadratic voting was, you know, they've experimented with it using, um, just for doing things like, what's, what's this called? Um, uh, um, just polling, right? Where people are, are being asked, how much do you care about this political issue? Or how much would you care for this particular thing to happen? And typically, people using what's called the Likert scale, just kind of grading from 1 to 10 or whatever, tended to give really extreme answers. Um, and they tended to always give extreme answers. Or at least that was, there, there's an incentive to always go to the extremes with, with simple Likert method. But with quadratic, quadratic voting, suddenly people cooled off, right? They, or they're not, they didn't even cool off. They, got, they, they, they honed in on the things they really cared about. But we got to actually discover what they care about. You know, the, what we're seeing here is the little gray bars are the strength of preference someone stated with a simple Likert scale. So both of these voters, in the, or both of these you know, respondents in this poll, basically maxed out every single one. Both of them only, only didn't care about one of them. But using a quadratic voting system, you know, suddenly we get to see what they actually care about. This person on the right, for example, they really only care about three issues. And the rest of them didn't get any weight at all. So that's interesting, right? Where we look around at our society and we see, we see all these issues that seem like they are hot buttons, right? They're, they seem like things that people would just kill each other about. And I think it's, it's, there's, there's some experimental evidence I'm showing here that you can go read into more deeply if you, if you please, that that's just not true. People don't actually care about a lot of these things nearly as much as they say they do because talk is cheap. If they really had to be honest and they really had to, if they had the opportunity to really signal correctly what they really care about, suddenly their, view, their views are much more reasonable and much more nuanced. So resource voting, like provably, <laughs> removes this problem of spam voting. 
if I have a finite pool of votes and I choose to use them on one thing, then kind of by, by ne it's ne necessarily I care more about that thing than all of the other options I could have put those votes on. So a vote suddenly meaningfully signals concern, right, that you care about something, and confidence that the vote you're giving you feel like is a good, you know, buy for those votes. You think it's, it's actually, you're, you're giving useful information because otherwise you could put it somewhere else. Um, I guess this is, this is me saying what I just said, <laughs> right? Choosing, you know, if, if you have uh, finite votes, all of the votes that you choose really are something that at least strategically you think is, is important more than other things. And what it, kind of this does is it makes voting a true negotiation, right? Maybe some group of people really does care about two issues, but they can kind of trade issues off and they can work with things depending on how much other people care about them. Right? Voting is a real negotiation rather than this dumb, you know, everyone's screaming at each other. And this is an, another really interesting way that this can, changes how we can think about voting. Usually you can only vote four things, which makes sense, right? You can, you can, you're, you can only cast a vote in, in favor of, of some option. But with a resource voting system, it suddenly makes sense. It's actually, you know, like strategically sound or, or not silly for people to be able to cast negative votes, right? To just be able to say, hey, that option over there, I just don't want it to happen. I want my, my votes to count against it. You know, I want my, my, my votes that I'm putting on this to subtract from its total. And what that means is that someone who, someone who doesn't know what the right answer is, you know, can look at, can look at all the candidates and say, uh, I, I don't know which one of these is good, but I know these ones are unacceptable to me. I know that these violate my values or they will cause me some sort of harm or something. I know those are unacceptable. So everyone else gets to choose what it is, but it's not going to be that. And I'm going to give that, that signal. That's useful because someone can be a non-expert, but still give useful information about what they want and what they care about. So resource voting, <laughs> it, I guess, yeah, I, this, this way of putting it, resource voting methods actually accomplish what, what we call representative democracy pretends to accomplish. So you look around at our, at our, at least in the United States, at our voting systems and our government, and we have all these weird structures, these kind of made up checks and balances systems that really are all about, you know, slowing things down. They're about helping minorities. It, it's really what a lot of these are about. They're helping passionate minorities who are maybe concerned about being harmed, helping passionate minorities to keep casual majorities from stampeding over them. That's what a lot of this stuff is really about, if you kind of look into how the, the framers of the Constitution were thinking. The thing is, all of these rules are really weird and ad hoc. They're kind of, you know, cooked up by a bunch of guys who had never thought about, like, the math of voting. And the math of voting hadn't even been existed or hadn't even been invented at that point. So all of the stuff they came up with, it doesn't work. <laughs> it doesn't solve the problem. It, it creates gridlock. It makes things slow. It makes things inefficient. It means that different parts of the system are just, you know, really vulnerable spots that can be captured by people who know how, how it all works. Whereas resource voting systems actually just, you get this for free. You get the fact that passionate minorities can outvote casual majorities all of a sudden because they can put more of their votes on something and they can suddenly just win. They don't have to have, you know, a, a Senate protecting them or whatever. Now, of course, it's possible for us to overcompensate. You know, we don't want passionate minorities to be the only ones who ever get to decide anything. We do think that majorities and large groups of people, that matters. Um, so, you know, ca casual opinions are still somewhat useful, right? They have information in them about what people want and what people care about. So casual opinions should still matter somewhat. Um, so again, I'm gonna, this is gonna be brief. I'm just gonna breeze through this. If you are interested in quadratic voting, go read about it. There's a lot out there. But quadratic voting has actually been proven, right? The, it's, there's a mathematical proof that quadratic voting balances these two problems um, basically perfectly of, you know, giving passionate majorities a voice versus casual majorities. And the basic idea is you take the amount of votes, you know, actual votes someone, or the amount of votes that someone casts, or the, they call them voting credits, um, and you take the square root of it. And this, you know, math happens 
I guess the simple reason, I mean, like, uh, it, I don't know. I don't want to get into this. It's whatever. But basically making people, um, squaring, square rooting the people's votes kind of compensates other voters for their increased probability of losing. Um, and there are like roughly n squared relationships between n people. Okay, whatever. I'm, I'm breezing past all of this. Go read about it. Um, we'll just read this really fast. This will be my final, the final thing I'll say about it. Um, quadratic voting achieves a perfect balance between the free rider and the tyranny of the majority problems. Free rider is when a small, you know, a minority is kind of, or rather it's, it's just when a group of people is letting someone else, some other group of people do all the work. And they're talking about this in the context of voting here. Um, so if the cost of voting increased more steeply, say as the fourth power of votes rather than the second power of votes, those with strong preferences would vote too little and we would revert to a partial tyranny of the majority. If the cost of voting increased more slowly, those with intense preferences would have too much say as a partial free rider problem would prevail. So anyway, go, go read about this, whatever. I'm not going to get into this more. But, you know, as much as resource voting is extremely natural, as elegant as it is, and how it solves all these problems, there's still things that are large problems that we need to kind of smooth out. Otherwise, they could kind of make things, you know, continually problematic for us. One of them is, at least in most conceptions of resource voting systems, like quadratic voting, they think of it as, you know, every year or every month, people are kind of, you know, issued a certain number of votes. And they can choose to save those votes up across, across elections. And as much as that may or may not make sense or whatever, it certainly produces a problem where a majority of people can, can intentionally save up or whatever and bankrupt a small number of people. Or maybe not even intentionally. It can kind of happen by accident. Just if the same measure gets you know, repeatedly proposed over and over and over again, it means that a group of people who is intensely opposed to that thing happening can just kind of be bankrupted by this, this thing being repeatedly proposed. I think that's a, that's a problem. It's something that could, could go really poorly. Um, also, just, you know, resource voting elections, it's possible for a, a very small number of voters to determine or change the result of an election. And on the one hand, that is something we want. That's actually part of the point. But, you know, occasionally that will mean weird stuff will happen. Things that we just look at and say, oh, no, we, we don't want that. That's clearly not what we meant. But no one quite understood, you know, the importance of this particular election or didn't see something coming. Um, and probably the biggest problem is that's just that it doesn't solve one of the, the biggest questions we have in voting systems and governance in general, which is what, what decisions do we even make in the first place? What elections are there, right? Resource voting systems can say what um, candidates there are and who wins, but not which elections to have in the first place. <laughs> So that's kind of this bigger problem that if we want to make what I'm going to be calling a true democracy, then even that has to be democratically decided somehow too. What elections do we even have? So I'm going to get into this and we're going to get into this idea of persistent democracy and specifically persistent voting by talking about how that even this thing, this concept of deadlines in elections is something you have probably haven't thought about ever before but that I think is definitely one of the things that's causing the, our problems, which is that, you know, there's a two week period or a month period or however long, depending on the election, where everyone votes. And at the end of that period, the result is final and, and that's it. Um, it means the ele the, we, we just have to live with whatever happened in that election for four years or two years or six years or whatever it happens to be. So I'm just trying to argue that that deadline problem is actually much more serious than anyone I think realizes because it produces a bunch of issues. One is that it gives you know possible bad actors a very narrow window, a short period of time where that's where they can get all of their all of their mischief done and they only have to do it for two weeks or for whatever you know if they want to make it difficult for some group of people to vote, they only have to do so for two weeks. And then after that, they, they, they win. Or, you know, marketing and misinformation. If someone wants to just spam the electorate with a ton of information, a marketing blitz, or, or have a bunch of crazy propaganda go out, 
where they're trying to get some particularly salient idea in everyone's brain so that that's what they're thinking about when they go to the polls. That's really cheap. You only have to run marketing for two weeks to get people in a different mind state if there's a hard deadline like that. It also means that the voter turnout is suddenly really important. Like It matters that everyone gets out and they get out in this critical window. And something that happens routinely, and especially could happen with better voting methods, is that occasionally weird stuff would happen. Occasionally a small number of voters would be the deciding factor in some election, and everyone would say, oh, that's, that's not what we preferred there. Um, these things, election hangovers is what they call this, right? And election hangovers are just where, yeah, maybe people didn't quite understand the importance of some election, or they didn't quite understand where some candidate was coming from, or they didn't know that some people cared about this, or they didn't think about this one very much, or they decided not to vote, or whatever. And suddenly, you know, weird surprises and all these, these possible s crazy things are irreversible. They're something we can't do anything about. Um, just generally, I guess as a side note, this relates to this idea of strategic voting. You know, strategic voting is when people, when people vote, but they don't vote perfectly honestly. They don't vote for exactly what they want. They vote for what they think they have to vote for based on what other people are going to vote for, um, just trying to kind of outgame each other. And deadlines make strategic voting much more serious because everyone's trying to kind of read each other and figure out what's going to happen before there's this big bang and, ever, and the whole thing is over and, and it's all decided. So, all right, to understand this and to really get into persistent democracy, I'm going to try to do so by example. It's kind of hard. <laughs> um, especially, we're going to try to talk about persistent voting and how it works. So, first, we're going to talk about persistent voting, kind of a more understandable way on a smaller scale in a theoretical city, right, with someone participating who's not super politically active. Then we're going to kind of scale up to a country and ask how can something like this make a really big difference um, and really change the way we think about how, how things are run. And then we're going to kind of get a more realistic short-term example of something like a cooperative. A cooperative is a private business that it's owns, owned by its customers rather than investors or whoever. Um, and these kind of private organizations, it's going to be my pitch later on, that these are the place where we should be doing experimentation and figuring out if this persistent democracy stuff actually works. <laughs> it's, a, it's an opportunity, it's a place where we could validate the idea and, and experiment and make sure that we're not changing our, our governments and maybe causing problems. Okay, and yeah, in the process of this, I'm gonna be trying to convince you that, that persistent voting, um, which is voting that is continuous and doesn't have hard deadlines, right, where, where everyone can change their votes at any time. I'm going to try to convince you that if you, do, if you do that right, if you design it intelligently, then it will be stable, right, it won't be a, a chaotic mess, um, it will be humanely paced, it will, it will uniquely and surprisingly make it possible for true democracy to really happen, and it will be really flexible and not require the, the system to be a pure direct democracy. It will still allow people to delegate to experts and not have to make every decision dem democratically all the time. Okay, and here are the three things. I think I kind of went through that. Okay, so versus voting. My pitch, at least the first, the first part of it that you really have to understand before we can talk about what persistent democracy is, is this idea of voting without deadlines. Voting that is going on, just kind of happening, and that you can go and change your vote at any time. So persistent voting certainly relies on the idea on you know, being a resource voting system where you have a supply of voting weights, I call them. You have some, some supply of voting weights, maybe it's 10,000 voting weights, maybe it's a million, doesn't actually matter the number. And you basically place them, you move them around on different elections and different um, uh, candidates at different times. And that, that moving is important, right? Where you move your weights around rather than spending them and they go away, like is, is kind of thought of in you know, the, all the research about things like quadratic voting. So you don't lose your weights when you put them on something. They, you put them on something and they stay there and then you can move them around and change your mind. And of course, yeah, it's a resource voting system. So if you put more weights on something, then you're voting harder for that thing. You know, the, your vote counts more. And yeah, you can do this at any time. You can, you can go in and you can change your votes. I mean, basically at any time. We'll get into specifically how that works. 
And candidates, you know, who's actually running for these different decisions, which we'll get to in a second, can be not just people and also be documents. We'll talk about that. Candidates can enter or exit elections at any time as well, right? So again, voting without deadlines. So how, you know, probably people hear that and they think, oh man, that sounds like a mess. So there's three main things that I'm going to try to convince you, if, again, if we do it right, we can avoid. That would be problems if we didn't avoid them. So one thing is it could be tiring, right? We're like, oh, do I have to vote all the time? Am I going to be on my phone on all hours of the day voting constantly? No, not if we, if we have something called periodic update schedules. Um, is it going to be super unstable where the mayor is going to change four times every hour and what's going on? No, not if we have something called stabilization buckets. And then is this going to be super noisy? Is, are, are people going to you know, nominate 10,000 candidates and I'm going to have to go through this big list to see who's the real candidates and who, who I actually should try to vote for? And no, not if we have an idea called nomination buckets. Okay, so again, let's just, I'm just trying to keep this really narrowly focused first. I'm just going to try to help you understand persistent voting and then we can understand how that generalizes, how it, how it broadens. So let's say you live in a city that has imp implemented um, persistent democracy. So it is persistently democratic. Um, and you know, you say, say you kind of dislike the current district attorney, you want them to, be, to, be, to change, there's a different candidate you like better. Um, your friend is the parks commissioner, so you like your friend, you think they're trustworthy, they're doing a good job. And then you want to nominate a new police chief. You know, you're not even necessarily unhappy with a police chief, but you, you have become involved with the campaign and there's someone you want to, to newly enter the race and, and take over that job. So the first question is, all right, if I'm voting, I can vote continuously. I can go change my vote at any time. Uh, how do I do that? Do I vote on the internet or, or what? Um, we'll talk about how we maybe could vote on the internet in the short term future, but I certainly think that for cities and countries, you know, governments where kind of security matters a lot more, um, and especially, you know, identity, you know, the people not being able to make fake identities to vote a ton or to use, you know, spam bots to vote a ton, it's really important for the voting to happen in person. Um, or at least for votes to be checked in person. Anyway, I'll talk about this in a second. So the way I'm thinking about this is that, you know, in this theoretical city in the far future, um, someone, if they wanted to vote or they wanted to change their votes, they want to move their voting weights around, they would go to a voting office. Uh, maybe it's the same building as the post office or the library. And first we'd have someone there, you know, probably democratically elected, to check your ID, you know, and your ID needs to be free and easy to get. That's, that's a topic for a different time. Um, but they check your ID to make sure you're, you know, a real person, not, you know, a, a spam bot or something. And then you go into a private booth with a voting computer where you can look at all your votes. You know, probably this is the only place where you can see precisely what your votes are so that no one can tell what your votes are so they can't bribe you into voting a certain way. And this is also the only place where you can change your votes. You can move them around, right? So you can't have a spam bot or something do it for you to have you be bribed or whatever. So anyway, you can sit there and you can look at where your votes are all, and you can move them around. You can change things, or your weights rather, let's say that word. Um, and yeah, this is where you kind of do all this stuff. I go a lot more into the details of how this could work in this link, um, Persistent Logistics, that I'll, I'll include in the description. But yeah, there's lots of things to consider here, right? There's security questions, there's there's kind of efficiency and financial questions. Um, I think that if, if persistent democracy was validated, if we prove it in smaller contexts first and find that, yeah, this works, then it would be worth it. It would be absolutely worth it. And especially, you know, we already have, at least in the United States, we have what's called the, um, the universal post office or the postal service mandate, right? The government is legally required to service everyone through the mail system. So we get a very similar thing for these voting offices, but there's lots of stuff to consider. It's very important to get right, but that's something you can go look at. The other question is, okay, well, you know, when do I vote? So I don't vote over the internet, that's okay. That means I can't, you know, sit on my phone and become updating my votes constantly, which is probably a good thing. That probably would be tiring. But, you know, when do I vote? When, when do I go to this post office place? Do I have to do this every day or what, what's going on? 
And ultimately, it kind of depends. Um, I think it would be an intentional part of any, so say, let's say the city that we're talking about. This city has decided that they are going to have what I'm calling the update schedule of one week, right? So we have, what this means is that every Monday at 1 a.m., basically that's the only moment where the system actually measures and say, okay, what, what are all the votes looking at like right now? And I'm going to sample that, and I'm going to use that to recalculate everything. Um, instead of, you know, the alternative, which is someone goes into vote and everything is recalculated right then, right? Which means that I could be in the middle of my work day on a Thursday, and the votes that I cast earlier in the week could be beaten by someone else who's going in there right this second. So although that sounds pretty bad and annoying. So instead, yeah, this, this idea of, 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 you know, a periodic uptake schedule of, of one time a week means that basically everyone can go in and change their votes and shuffle things around at any time during the week they want, but then only then at the end of the week. You know, here I'm giving the example of Monday at 1 a.m. It could be any time, doesn't matter. That is when everything actually happens, when those, all those votes kind of are measured or they come, become real and everything is recalculated. Um, that, this just means that instead of everyone having to feel like they could vote all the time, Instead, it's, oh, at, at most, at most, I'm going to vote once a week. And of course, different cities could choose different amounts of time. It could be every two weeks, it could be every month. We could ever get crazier, make it longer. We start losing the benefits of the, con of the continuous voting, voting idea at some point. But, you know, we can sh move that number around depending on how stressful people find it to go in and, and think about this. Um, yeah, so I guess this is what I was saying, you know. So let's let's say our example of someone who wants to change the district attorney and the parks commissioner and the police chief, you know, they know it's only useful to vote at, mo at most once a week. Um, so they, let's say, they usually do it Tuesday evening. They usually go grocery shopping on Tuesday evening. They usually do it then. Um, but of course, you know, if someone is looking at all of the results of things, which, you know, by the way, you can only change or look at your votes in, in the voting office, but you can see what's happening from the outside all the time. You kind of get like a, a you know, anonymous read-only view at all times. Um, you know, if you say, eh, no, I, I think I'm happy with where my, my weights are all, all set right now. Everything, everything, I wouldn't change anything even if I went in. Then you don't have to bother. You can just leave them there, and that's great. So then there's this question of, okay, <laughs> stabilization, you know, when, when I'm thinking about who I want to win or who I'm worried about maybe, you know, getting knocked off, um, how do I think about this strategically? So I think it's pretty important in a persistent voting system to have some stabilization me um, method where, um, so for example, I mean, let's just, let's just look at the example. <laughs> um, let's say that we have, you know, two people who are running for, I don't know, a mayor and they have a certain number of votes. You know, one of them has a, has a lot more weights at this point than the other one. Um, and so since they have the most, they are the one who currently holds the position. Great. But then let's say, you know, purple surges ahead. But they surge ahead only by a little bit. They have a tiny lead. So if we did this wrong, they would, they would become the winner now, and it would change. And then maybe we'd have this, them going back and forth like this of, oh, now, now I'm the mayor, now I'm the mayor, now I'm the mayor, now, you know, I, now I am. That wouldn't be great. So instead what we do is we have this idea of stabilization buckets. So basically, if someone, if, if we have a, a winner, but someone overtakes that winner by some amount, then basically the difference, the difference between them, is basically starts to, to that, that amount starts to kind of fill up a, a bucket, so to speak, this stabilization bucket. Um, and essentially, you know, every, every voting period, every week or every day or whatever, every period that that lead is held, that fills up the bucket a little bit more, right? And if the bucket is only a little tiny bit, if the person's only a little bit ahead, then the bucket fills really slowly, which means it'll take a long time for this person to actually win, right? But if they have a huge lead, right, then it fills up a lot faster. And of course, if, you know, I don't have this on the slide, but if they lose their advantage, if they actually fall behind, their stabilization bucket starts to drain according to the difference. So, you know, the benefit of this should be obvious. Of, it means that, you know, if, if, if an election is, is not very certain, 
then it can change, but it'll take longer to change. It's more stable, right? Because what we're seeing here is that the electorate, the voters, are less certain, right? There's this negotiation happening. If people are battling with each other, and we don't really have a strong answer. People aren't super confident they want things to change. So it can change, but slowly. And then the opposite, you know, if, if something is really confident, if we say, oh, this, this option has dominated all the other options, then it will happen much more quickly. Yeah, so I mean, stabilization, stabilization buckets ensure voters are confident in a change. So this just makes sure that that the the change we see is is metered by how sure people actually are in it. So you know, how big are these stabilization buckets? You know, how long do they take to fill up? Um, I haven't figured out the exact numbers yet. Honestly, this is something that could change depending on a lot of things. Um, but I certainly know two things it really ought to follow is that you know a, uh, an election should be more stable. It should be more difficult to change. The stabilization should be bigger if the election potentially affects more people, right? It's, it's, it's a bigger deal for a country of 300 million people to have uh, something change than a town of 1,000 people. And you know if the electorate is more spread thin is why I'm putting this, as in there's more decisions that they could all be, be participating in meaning that each decision gets less attention from each from all of them individually. Probably that should change slower because less people, you know, it, we don't want it to change fast before people maybe have a chance to notice it if it's important. So, okay, returning to our example. Um, let's say you know that, you know, the district attorney is, he's, he's the one you want, is getting closer, he's almost to the point where he's overtaken the opponent, um, and you think that if you s stack quite a bit more weights on here, then you can get him to, to actually start filling his, his stabilization bucket. But then you look over at the Parks Commissioner, your friend, and he's, he's, well, he's well in the lead. And everyone likes that person. Everything's going great. So you move some onto that, but not really very many. OK, then there's this question of nomination buckets. So the same thing of, you know, there's, there's a problem that we need to make sure doesn't happen where, where, I don't know, even if someone could do it automatically, if can, can someone can someone nominate 10,000 people and suddenly there's this huge you know, spam of people? None of those people would have very many votes because people have to put weights on them. But still, even if, even if there's 10,000 people that all have a tiny, tiny amount of, of weights on them, that's still noise that we'd rather not deal with and is not necessary to deal with. So what we do is we have this idea of nomination buckets, where if you have a new candidate you want to enter a race, um, you know, anyone can nominate anyone at any time, or anyone can jump into the race themselves. But in order to become a real candidate, one who's actually vying and getting proper weight, people have to take weights and put them specifically on this, this nominee, and they have to fill up a nomination bucket, right? So over time, you know, if someone is a nominee, a nominee that everyone has a ton of support, they'll get into the race quickly. But even also dark horse candidates, they can get in. It'll just take a, a while for them to do so. Um, and you know, this is just a good thing to kind of prevent nonsense candidates, is what we're calling them. You know, ca nonsense candidates that are intentionally there just to gum up things or make make the election harder to read and understand. Um, you know, noisy elections aren't. That's not actually useful. Um, if someone, if a candidate is real and they have are actually providing a real option to people then they can prove it by having people nominate them for a period. Yeah, so I mean, this is, this is just a good thing where someone fills up their bucket, they get in, and that person has kind of proven that they're real. And they're proven that they're real even with a small number of people, right? If a small number of people are willing to nominate someone for a long period of time, that's just as real as if a large number of people did for a short time. So yeah, I mean, these are sized kind of similarly to stabilization buckets. Um, you know, it gets more difficult to nominate someone, basically, you know, your bucket fills up slower if the election is more noisy, so to speak, if there's already lots of stuff. So, I mean, again, you know, if the election is larger, it's harder to nominate someone because you're creating noise for more people. You know, it's more crowded by the number of, of voters. We don't want to, you know, to, to impose noise on that many people. And, you know, if the election itself, the number of candidates is noisy, so there, there's, if there's lots of candidates who are already nominated, or there are a ton of nominees competing, right? Both of those things make it more 
we're, we basically we just want to kind of reduce noise. So if noise is increasing, it gets harder to enter the election. So yeah, you are looking at the police chief um, election, and you say, oh, you know, um, uh, there's only really there's not very many nominees, and so this police chief, uh, like, I'm going to stick a bunch of weights on him, and it'll be great, <laughs> and we'll uh, and we'll wait for him to go. I'm not nominated. You know, this, this group I'm with, we did the math, and we think he'll be nominated in about a month. So anyway. OK, so I guess there's, there's the example. And I was kind of editorializing as I went. But let's just ask this question. Uh, why do I think that this idea of persistent voting is exciting? Why does this solve problems? How does this make things better? Um, the first obvious thing is that it gets all the benefits of resource voting, right? All of the, the reduction of spam voting, the, the measurement of, of real voter concern and confidence, all that stuff. We get all of that for free. But some of the more interesting things is stuff like this, right? Because the elections are continuous, they're going on at all times, they don't have deadlines. It's actually not a problem for any period of time for voters to just not really participate very much. Um, I'm calling this delegation by abstention. You know, if there's a small number of people who are civically minded and they deeply research these questions and they care a lot, and if they are really the ones who do the most voting and they kind of end up making most of the decisions, that's actually fine um, as long as everyone else is okay with those decisions. So they say, oh, yeah, you know what? Those, guys, those people over there who's ever making the decisions looks great. <laughs> Everything's fine. But the thing is, it would be a problem if this small minority could, was, was, could always dominate elections and they were always the ones deciding everything. The thing is, if this small minority begins to do things that are considered harmful or, or unreasonable to everyone else, then everyone else can immediately just move in and change things, right? There's no deadlines, which means that the majority can always you know, uh, become engaged. They can, they can engage whenever they think it actually matters to, whenever something happens that merits their concern. I mean, yeah, just generally, this is kind of, it's removing this problem of, elec of election hangovers and voter regret, right? If something bad happens in an ele election and someone takes over a position or they begin to fill up a stabilization bucket saying that they will at some point take over, everyone has time to say, oh, wait, do we actually want that to happen, right? Or, or in the next three weeks or whatever, can I find time to go in and say, no, we don't want that to happen, right? And again, the, the, the negotiation can, can occur, where the people who want something, the people who don't want it, can, can actually hash it out by moving weights around more and more strongly. And of course, people can nominate new candidates that are maybe more palatable to everyone and they're not going to be as divisive. So this kind of time for people to see things coming and to understand that these poss things are a possibility is, is, is just a good thing. It, it's helping everyone understand everyone else better. There's another thing. is if you want to flood the, the electorate with misinformation or propaganda, if you want to lie to everyone, you have to do so forever. You have to continue to do so over and over and over again, which, you know, people do. It's not impossible, but it's much more difficult. It's much more costly. It means that one clever marketing campaign for one week can't be the thing that turns the fates of an entire country. It's just not how it was going to work anymore. You have to repeatedly, repeatedly demonstrate um, some idea that's convincing to people. The same thing here, where everyone, everyone's always guessing about the horse race nature of politics because there's this impending deadline where all of a sudden everything's done and everyone has to live with the results. So predicting what is going to happen and predicting what everyone else is doing and reading the room is really important. It's genuinely important. It's not when people on, on, on news channels are doing this horse race treatment of politics, that's not irrational. That is not you know, human nature taking over and, and being stupid. That's the right thing to do because that's probably the, one of the most important things that determines what happens, reading everyone else. In a persistent election, the election is the poll. We know what everyone's voting for. We know what people care about. It's right there. And we know when something starts to change that it's happening. And we can say, oh, interesting. And we can update our beliefs, update our opinions about the electorate around us, and make a choice about what we really care about. It's not some weird game we have to play. 
Okay, I'm not doing this justice, but this is very important. It's something I'm skimming by. You can go read, um, you can go read about this online. Again, I have a link to persistentdemocracy.org that talks about things like this. Persistent commitments, you know, sometimes we do have to make decisions that are irreversible. We have to spend money, we have to make some, some judgment, you know, like a justice thing. Or there, there's lots of decisions we have to make that are irreversible, that we have to make a commitment and has to have a deadline. But the way we can do this differently is um, it's more or less stealing the idea of conviction voting, more or less, but using persistent weights and such. So basically, if there's a deadline, let's say that, that someone has to decide on a budget. We'll get into documents in a second. <laughs> let's say that there's some decision we have to make, you know, like a budget decision, and we have a month to make it. What we can do there is people can put their weights on different options but basically those weights actually increase, or, or rather the, the strength of that vote slowly increases to its maximum over time, rather than happening immediately. And then if someone moves their vote, say like, like this, they, the same they nominated this budget document instead of this budget document, and they change their mind halfway through the, the month before the, the deadline, and they want to move over to this, instead of their, mo their, their weight and the vote strength moving over immediately, it moves over slowly kind of, you know, slowly kind of transfers from one thing to the other thing. The idea here is that we're trying to reduce, you know, weird strategic um, voting, weird strategic swings, where, where someone could be watching you know, a commitment like this and then suddenly jump in at the 11th hour, throw a bunch of weights on something, and surprise everyone, right? We're trying to reduce surprises. So what we're doing is we're saying, okay, since this commitment it has a deadline and we have to make a decision we have to live with then we really want people with with you know sturdy demonstrated consistent opinions to to win out and this commitment probably we ought we ought to always have one option buying is do nothing um and you know if if the thing if the some other choice doesn't beat do nothing um, handily enough then we do nothing we default to that anyway Again, not doing this justice. Links online if you're curious. Okay, to me this is the really exciting stuff. This is where things start to open up and what makes persistent voting and persistent democracy genuinely exciting. Is that if it's, if it's reasonable t for things to be kind of going on at all times and if it's stable and, and if low voter engagement isn't a problem and if, if no election is going to ever be irreversible and we don't have to get everything right the first time, it's possible for us to have elections for documents instead of people, right? We don't have to only elect representatives. We can just elect the laws themselves. We can elect the actual governance documents. We can do it directly. So <clears throat> again, to kind of get this, to, to un help to understand this more, more concretely, let's say that a country is being governed using persistent democracy. So obviously, you know, a country, the top level, you know, the highest level of the law is a single document, right? It is the constitution. The constitution of a country kind of determines everything down from that point, what is kind of allowed at all layers of governance below that. Which means that, you know, <laughs> if we can choose that document democratically, it means that the entire country is truly democratic. Um, because everyone can possibly have a voice in what the Constitution is, and they can have that voice directly. Okay, let's go through this by example, then I'll try to tell you why I think this is a good thing. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's honestly, it's, it's much like any other election. You have an election for a, a Constitution, or a tax code, or a whatever. You have ele elections for any kind of document. Um, and anyone can propose a document. Importantly, they propose the whole document, Right? We don't propose like little amendments where little, 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 you know, that's the way our system works now where we have amendments and we have all this little, these, this pork and all these writers that comes in and we don't know if the amendments are going to change the law to be all weird and inconsistent. Instead, it's okay, people nominate a, a total document. They say, here's what the document should be in its entirety, consistent, here's my consistent picture for what it should be. Um, and then you have an election. A, a, a persistent vote, just like we talked about with those ones for mayors or, or anything, where people put weights on different documents, 
they nominate them, it's stabilization, et cetera, et cetera. All that stuff is, is the case. And whatever document is the current winner is the one that's in effect. So of course, you know, this has a lot of interesting possibilities because when you're nominating a person, you kind of, you know, you get that whole person. And it's hard to take two people, two candidates, and find a compromise between them. You kind of have to get a new, you have to make a new person who happens to agree with the nuanced position of those two people. With documents, that's not the case. You can have two documents, right, that have different opinions that are vying against each other in a, an election. And someone can say, oh, you know, people don't like this one for this reasons. People don't like this one for this reasons. I can just propose a third document that solves those problems and is, is literally just chunks of those two in a, in a, different, in a different order, or, you know, put together more intelligently. And suddenly that can make more sense. That can appeal to more people. So, you know, I, I'm a software engineer by trade, and so I can't help but think of t software version control systems where you can compare two documents and see the differences, and you can merge documents together and all this stuff. All of that would be possible. It wouldn't have to be baked into it, but there's a lot of interesting possibilities when you can do this. Um, so, you know, to kind of understand maybe concretely how this could work is you know, here's, here's a constitution, a rough sketch of maybe something like what I would propose if I was coming up with this. But, you know, it, it could work any way we want it. Again, people would all vote against each other and it would probably it would smooth out to be something reasonable. But here's something that I would propose. And again, I'm saying we should do this far in the future when we know that this is a good idea and we've, we've tested it in smaller, in smaller ways first. So I would say, in the Constitution I would propose, that first I'd have, you know, the, the main thing in the Constitution would be the, the Bill of Rights, so to speak, defining rights. To, and the whole purpose of defining rights is to, you know, we, we define rights to prevent people from being irre irreversibly harmed, right? We don't want people having elections to decide whether or not a group of people should be massacred. You know, that's not great. So we say, okay, you know, in, in, in our definition of rights, Certain things are just off the table. You can't have elections about these things. Um, and importantly, you know, if the Constitution applies to the whole country, those rights are the same way, the same in, in the whole country. And then something you can do is you can say, okay, my Constitution has this main part that we voted for, but then all these subparts, I can split them off. I can say, oh, you know, the 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 legal codes, the actual precise laws that that just clarify these rights. Though that's a separate document, and we, we have a separate election for that, right? So we can change that independent of everything else. And then we also split off the agencies and the officials. So like, what federal agencies are there? What elections do we have? Do we have a president? Do we have a Congress, right? All the officials, right? All that stuff would be separately decided. I'd split off the budget, probably. Um, and then one of the most important things is you split off as a separate document to have a separate election, the district map. This is another really a cool, exciting idea, which is that you can actually vote. You can have a document that people can vote on of what the borders of the, of the districts and the states inside the country are. And this is a good idea for a couple of reasons. Um, you can include you know, what parts of the country are protected, what, what parts are national parks or national forests or whatever. Um, I'll, I'll go over that in a second. Do I have the yeah, there it is. So you know, here's this idea of splitting. We have a main document that I'm proposing that this should be the, the rule. And if it is the rule, then there we have separate elections for these subparts of the Constitution. We kind of split it into pieces. Um, and those are, those are voted on separately. And this idea of, of districts, you know, districts defined in the Constitution as a separate document or not, they basically say, oh, here's, here's our, you know, management districts. You know, this, this area is governed by people and, you know, they're going to have their own elections. Um, and then this part is a national forest, and over here is a separate part. Um, I mean, again, I have, I have more stuff in that persistentdemocracy.org, that book online, about why this is a good idea of just, you know, a lot of the borders that we look around at the, wor at the world, a lot of the borders we have now were drawn 200 years ago or 500 years ago and don't really reflect how people live their lives on the ground anymore. And especially as technology changes and infrastructure changes and culture changes, probably borders should change. Borders should change, and they should change more fluidly and more democratically. It's it, borders are not you know some sacred law. 
they're just something we do to help split up responsibility and say, okay, you guys can all deal with what's going on over there. We'll deal with what's going on over here, but we'll share a broader governmental superstructure. You know, we'll have the same rights. We'll have some shared infrastructure. We'll have stuff, but we can divide up responsibility for different areas. So what this produces is this constitutional tree, right? If we have a main constitution that splits off sub documents, but it also makes sub districts beneath itself, right? Where it splits up different states or different districts or different provinces or whatever. And then it can say, oh, those can also have their own sub constitutions that maybe do that again, right? That split off some of the decisions and do it again and do it again and do it again. This is the idea of subsidiarity. Subsidiarity is just where a decision should be made at the lowest level, or basically should be made as close to where it's relevant as possible. You know, people in, I happen to live in Salt Lake City, Utah. Um, Salt Lake City, Utah has very different kind of management problems than New York City, right? Just because of where it is geographically, what the climate is like, what the existing city is like. The types of things they need to worry about, the types of rules they need to make are different than what's needed here. And that's fine. So this constitutional tree means that we can design the whole governmental structure fluidly and figure out what it should be as the times change. And we should all, always keep it consistent, right, where we nominate an entire constitution in its entirety. So, yeah, I mean, this is also one of the reasons. Yeah, this is also one of the reasons why... <laughs> why probably a lot of the things people assume would be bad about you know, a more direct democracy wouldn't happen. is because when you have a constitutional tree like this, which makes sense, a constitutional tree is very reasonable, when you have this kind of tree, suddenly every voter has lots of different things they can vote about, lots of different questions they can be involved in, and lots of different levels they can be involved in. If they care more about national problems and questions of rights and law, they vote in national elections where more people are being affected and more people are competing, but also the effect, uh, uh, dec decisions are more, you know, have more scope. Maybe they care more about local things, right? Maybe they care more about regional problems of resource management or hush hunting and fishing and environment, all this stuff. Um, you'll see, yeah, go to presidentsofdemocracy.org. There's lots of ways we can think about how to actually structure a system like this if we just start with the idea that all decisions should be determined by these branching constitutions that we can then decide at lower and lower levels what happens at that level. Suddenly, again, it gives many people many more opportunities to only participate in things they really care about and not everything all the time. So, yeah, I mean, you know, you can see probably how this is just arbitrarily flexible. We're nominating documents and the documents can say anything, you know. We're deciding on them democratically which means that people have the opportunity to you know, smooth each other out and, and find reasonable compromises and not do crazy things. But you know, we can still have delegation. We can find officials or we can find experts and we can say, okay, we can have election and, and choose to trust you to figure out this subset of problems that we don't understand. And we say, you, you, you have the, the you're, we're gonna give you the authority to deal with this. Um, you know, we can make sure that, that governance is sub, you know, follows subsidiarity. We can make sure that different aspects of, of, of governing and, and working together as a community are kind of split up so they don't have to be mushed together in the same documents. They can be reasoned about separately if they're truly separate. Yeah, it's just arbitrarily flexible. And yeah, this. This, this, is, this is kind of one of my, my, I'm kind of coming into my final, final stage here. That this system creates, it actually truly creates a real democracy. Every voter has the same potential impact on every decision that, that, that affects them. Um, they can always, right, if someone is unsatisfied with everything, they can go to some constitutional level and they can nominate a new constitution or they can, they can, vote for an existing constitution they think reflects their what they want better. And of course, if the constitution is, is satisfying to them, they can always vote on the smaller things, the things that constitution defines. Everyone has potential impact on everything. 
if not directly, then through an elected official. In our current system, that is not true. Because I, the only way I can affect what's in the Constitution is to participate in an election in a gerrymandered district that was chosen by cabals of groups of people that I don't have any control over, et cetera, et cetera. We genuinely don't have true democratic control over every aspect of our governance. Not really. Um, we have to find the little nooks and crannies where the levers of power are controlled. And if maybe if we can game that system, we can have a real impact on everything. In a system like this, it's, it's, it's true. And of course, every, everyone has that, which means the resource voting question means that you know, everything balances out. Another important thing is that something I encounter that I agree with in spirit, but not in, in, in specifics, is that experts should probably make more decisions in, in a lot of governmental functions. I think that's broadly true. But those experts must have democratic legitimacy. I mean, it, for one and only reason is that there's different kinds of experts, right? There's experts in all different fields. There's experts of different, sometimes fields are split into different camps and different ways of thinking. And so the thing is, at the very least, which kind of expert we're going to choose for what positions needs to be determined somehow. And it needs to be determined by what people care about, right? An expert, if they are truly an expert, they are always going to be capable of, you know, optimizing some domain, right? If an electrical engineer is put in a position, they'll be able to do electrical engineering problems to optimize electrical engineering applications. But maybe we don't care about optimizing that. Maybe we need to optimize something else. And so suddenly just, you know, put more weight in experts becomes pretty fallow when we realize that uh, expertise is, is, is just a tool. And it is a tool that is, is being deployed on behalf of the democratic will. We trust and delegate experts because they can do something we want. And if the experts are going to do something that doesn't create a, a public good in the kind of way people actually want, then their expertise is not important and shouldn't be trusted. And even, I guess maybe the final thing, I'll say about experts, is that even if an expert is making you know, a perfectly rational, optimized choice, that optimal, rational choice might still harm some people in some way. That's at least important for those people to have an opportunity to resist that thing happening in whatever way it is. So, OK, enough about experts. But essentially, this is a voting system, and it's the only voting system I've encountered where every voter can give an unbounded amount of information, right? Because they can nominate a document, then they can, they can say literally anything they want, and they can propose anything that seems reasonable to them. In normal elections, that's not the case. The only way you can have unbounded input is by becoming one of the elected officials. And because we have you know, this system of voting weights and nomination buckets and all this, this stuff, this, not, this unbounded information problem isn't actually a problem. Things won't become noisy. Everything will be balanced by these, these different systems. OK. I think we're almost there. OK, so I'll try to breeze through this one. This is, this is pretty, pretty quick. So how do we actually, if, if I've convinced you that at the very least this is an interesting idea we should experiment with, right? maybe you don't agree that it's perfect, but that at the very least we should give it a shot somewhere to see if it goes anywhere. We need to first validate it in a place where we can do so without causing trouble, right? Because this is extremely a very novel set of ideas. It's very different. It's very speculative. So what we should do is we should validate this idea of persistent democracy in um, private organizations. I talked earlier about cooperatives. You know, for example, someone could choose to, to govern a credit union using persistent democracy. They could govern smaller things, even a Discord server or a, an open source project or whatever. There's lots of different private, small communities that could use this, this system to, to govern themselves and make decisions. So that's broadly what I kind of want to do. That's kind of what I intend to do in the coming years. Um, and specifically, cooperatives, I think, are really powerful. I'm going to breeze through what they are really fast. Um, yeah, cooperatives, private companies owned by the members, right? So they're not owned by investors. They're not owned for profit. They're owned rather for the benefit of, of the members, of the customers. 
And, you know, things like credit unions already exist. A credit union is a bank that's owned by the account holders. And they're a proven model. They haven't lived up to their potential because of bad voting systems. You know, bad voting systems are bad for governments and they're bad for cooperatives. They mean the cooperatives are also sluggish and sometimes unaccountable and, and don't live up to their democratic potential. So I think cooperatives are exciting to me because they can help us solve some of these problems. I, at the beginning of the talk, I hinted at toxic media, for-profit media being a problem. A pretty simple solution is journalism cooperatives, you know, news media cooperatives that are owned by their audience, right? So instead of I subscribe to a newspaper, if you subscribe to something like a newspaper, instead of that money just going to whoever owns the newspaper, it is a, it, it entitles you to govern the newspaper or the, you know, website or whatever it is. This is something that we can solve a lot of these problems or the platform monopolies that are starting to exist. We can have just user own versions of those. And if they're actually valuable, they're continuing to exist. Um, yeah, lots more stuff. Um, you know, lots more you can read about this that, again, persistentdemocracy.org. You know, same thing. Uh, the cooperative can have a, a vote for a top level constitution. They can pursue initiatives according to that constitution. These private organizations can vote over the internet. It's less, less, less serious. You know, we can figure out those kind of problems as they come because uh, these private organizations can afford to fail. It's not going to destroy society <laughs> if it doesn't work. Okay, last section, and then we're done. True democracy is a moral imperative. Um, I've, I've been surprised as I have as I've been sharing this idea, that people are just skeptical of the idea of democracy itself. And again, everyone, everyone tends to say, oh yeah, people just suck too much. People are too irrational, they're too dumb, they're too ignorant, they're too whatever. And, you know, it tends to be, some people are very humble and they recognize, they point at themselves when they say people, they're including themselves. But a lot of people say, oh yeah, those people over there, they're too stupid, we can't have a functioning democracy because of them. You know, um, if, if, if me and my people were in power, everything would be great. But that, that's not what democracy is. And any group of people, if you genuinely believe that every person matters morally the same, right, that they have equal moral weight, it's impossible for you to say they shouldn't have equal input weight. If you care about someone's morality, if you care about, or rather you care about them as a moral agent, and you think they, they have moral value, you have to listen to what they want. You don't have to completely do everything they say because what they say is also going to be balanced with everyone else. But at the very least, what they want should have the same weight as what everyone else wants, no matter how unreasonable they are, no matter how irrational they are, no matter how broken they are. Um, you know, th this, this relates to this idea of expertise, and what I was saying earlier, of someone can be an expert in something and make terrible choices in terms of how it will help or hurt people. You can be an expert in one domain and know nothing about how that domain should actually be applied to the real world. I mean, you know, we can't, we can't just say we need to ignore people. People must be ignored because they're not rational enough to make good decisions. How do we measure who, who, is, who, enough, who is enough of an expert to get to have a voice? The only way we can choose experts in a way that even makes any sense at all is through democracy. <laughs> if someone is an expert, they can design plans that make sense and they have to persuade people. Even experts have no choice but to help people understand why their expertise is actually useful. Yeah, so, I mean, again, it's just, it's crazy, 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 crazy to, to, to say that you value all people equally morally and you don't think everyone should have the same amount of input weight in a democracy. Again, it, this doesn't mean we should have voter spam. It doesn't mean we should have the spoiler effect. We shouldn't have all these dumb logical inconsistencies in our, in our voting systems. The voting systems themselves should help us understand what people really actually want and what they actually care about. And when we have a real accurate picture of what people want, we kind of have no choice but to at least consider that as important as if any other group of people said the same thing or something different. 
So this is this is what resource voting systems and persistent constitutions do. They make sure that we actually know what people want, and we allow everyone to you know structure the system such that it's going to make them happy. And that means we can do anything underneath that. We can delegate our experts, we can construct all these systems, but all of that needs to be accountable to everyone and everyone equally. That doesn't mean everyone has to be sitting there clicking a button for every decision that we make, but it does mean they should have the option to, even if indirectly. So <laughs> this is something I'm trying to actually, I've been formalizing this, right? This idea of, you know, ethics and how we actually think about an ethical system. So I've been working on function comparing ethics. And a lot of this will go over a lot of my audience said, doesn't matter, I guess for people who consider themselves utilitarians or folks in the effective altruism community, um, this is something I'm working on. Expect more on this in the future. I'm actually trying to kind of work up some proof sketches that show that, you know, this way of thinking about about ethics is more reasonable and prioritizes democracy. Um, yeah. Okay. I think that that's basically everything. Just as a last as a last thing, I'm going to point you towards persistentdemocracy.org, which is a uh, quite short online book that is open source. You could suggest contributions to it if you want. That goes over the broad strokes of what persistent democracy really is, what it means what I would propose for a lot of the things we should do and then how we could achieve this. Um, thank you. It's been my pleasure to speak about this. I think this is one of the most important things that we as a, as a species, as, as, as humanity, needs to figure out because democracy is the only way we've come up with to help us all work together in a way that doesn't require weird, you know, arbitrary authority. So we got We have to figure out democracy. It is. It is critical. All right. Bye.